Believe it or not, it is October here in San Diego, California at the Epic Gardening headquarters, and there still are some incredible things to plant, not only in San Diego, but no matter where you live. So in today's video, we're giving you 11 amazing plants that you can put in your garden that are not only edible, but also beneficial for those of you in colder climates. We're bringing back some fan favorites. Chris from Vancouver, BC, Meg from North Carolina, of course, Jacques, and a newcomer, Angela from Growing in the Garden. So cultivate that like button for incredible plant selections. Let's get into the video. This first crop is absolutely one of my favorites, but also one of the world's favorites in the kitchen, and you need a lot of patience to grow it. It's taken me a few years to really dial it in for my climate, and that would, of course, be the humble garlic. If you're a longtime follower of the channel, you know I have had my trials and tribulations with garlic, mostly because it is a challenging crop that requires a lot of patience, sometimes 180, 200 days to grow this crop. But in 90 seconds, I'm gonna give you everything you need to know to successfully plant this crop. First off, types of garlic. The main two categories are hard neck and soft neck. Simple rule of thumb, the warmer your climate, the more you should be growing a soft neck garlic, like something called Enchelium red. Really good example. The colder your climate, the more you should grow a hard neck variety, something like a music garlic. Now the hard necks have something called a scape. It's a very delicious, delectable thing that you actually have to prune off when growing the garlic and you can use it in the kitchen. They also tend to be a little bit more spicy, a little more flavorful, but the soft neck garlic stores better and is a great all-purpose cooking garlic. Now the thing you're going to mess up when you're growing garlic, and I've done it before so don't worry about it, is planting time. So I'll start with the colder zones and then I'll move back up to my home zone here in San Diego, California. In a colder zone, four to six weeks before your frost, that might be right about now as you are watching this video. You don't need to do anything special. You just pop cloves out, put them pointy side up about four inches down in the soil and cover it up with some mulch. You're in a good spot. The garlic will experience the winter in the ground there, set some roots up and it will vernalize itself or it will be exposed to cold. It actually needs to be exposed to cold. As you move up in your zones, let's say you get into a six, seven, eight, maybe even a nine. You wanna plant in October, maybe a little bit closer towards November, and you don't need to do too much of the vernalization. But if you're in a warm climate like me, you need to fake that vernalization period with a refrigerator. That's what we've done here. A soft neck garlic, you'll toss in the fridge maybe about a month or so. If you wanna experiment with growing a hard neck garlic, which shouldn't grow in somewhere like San Diego, California, you can still do it. We've done it, we had a very successful crop a couple years ago. You can put it in the fridge for two or three months and then plant it later in November or so. And if you're in the market to grow your own garlic, we are stocking 14 different varieties of hard and soft neck garlic on the Epic Gardening store, so you can check that out in the link below. Still relatively unknown in North America, mash, lamb's lettuce, or more commonly corn salad is one of my favorite cold hardy greens to get into the ground right now for a fall and winter harvest. They're generally not fussy plants, and as long as they get a moist, cool spot with some sun, they do just fine. So after a quick cleanup of this bed, I am ready to sow. So no real big prep or amending required. And also if you're growing in a container, they are great for containers because the plants are just so small and adorable. There are a number of varieties of corn salad, so depending on what the size of the seed is, your sowing depth could be anywhere between quarter to half inch deep. If you're wanting to sow in nice neat rows, you'll want to thin the plants to roughly three to four inches apart, but if you're like me and you want to cover this bed with corn salad, so essentially a low growing cover crop, then you can broadcast the seeds to roughly about one inch apart. Once sown you want to make sure that the seeds are kept moist until germination and be patient because this process can sometimes take up to three weeks. Most varieties mature within 60 days and you can either harvest the leaves individually by pinching them off or you can use a knife and harvest the entire rosette at the base of the plant. The mild and succulent leaves are a bit nutty tasting and they add a great texture to salads but come spring especially when the temperatures start to increase and it gets warmer, the leaves take on this kind of soapy flavor that most people don't like. And at that point, you know it's time to remove the plants and then you can start sowing your next round of spring plants. There are so many plants out there that don't get the love that they actually deserve. And that's because a lot of people just don't realize how versatile they are. This one could be eaten raw, it could be pickled, it could be roasted, it could be sauteed with some stone ground mustard and tarragon in a pan, and it is quite good. And it could even be made into sugar. That is the humble root crop, the beet. 
Before we get going, I want to quickly mention that Beats are a lot like cilantro in the sense that if you don't like beets, it might not be your fault. There's a compound in there that tastes like irony, dirty earth. And if you have the gene for that, you're just not going to like them very much. But there is something to save you, and that is the golden beets. They have much, much, much less of that compound. They taste sweeter. They don't have that irony, earthy flavor. If you don't think you like beets, definitely try one more time with some golden beets. Now, when it comes to growing beets, there are a lot of different varieties. Now, I personally really like the red and the goldens. This is Robin, which is a small beet that actually forms much quicker than other beets. I think it's like 60 days instead of like 70 to 90. And the idea behind it is that you get these nice small round beets that are perfect for pickling. And pickled beets honestly are so good. I don't know why I don't eat them more often. Now, when it comes to golden beets, I really like Touchstone, Badger Flame, or Golden Boy, which is the one that I have growing right here. And the cool thing about beets is actually, I have an example right here, is that they can be grown either directly in the ground or as transplants. They're one of those rare root crops that doesn't really mind one way or another. Now, one more thing to mention about beets is that if you take a look at the seeds, it looks like a bunch of seeds stuck together, and that's because it is. It's actually a multi-seed. So when you put just one beet into a cell, don't be surprised if you see two to four seedlings pop out because there are multiple seeds in there. Now, you don't have to actually thin them if you don't want. You could grow them as a multi-sown beet, which is the act of just leaving them all bunched together like that. You'll get three small beets instead of one large beet, which is perfectly fine. Or you can even harvest the first beet that's big enough and leave the rest to continue growing. That's one of the great things about beets is that they're not just versatile in the kitchen, but they're also really versatile in the garden. If you're like me and you live somewhere like San Diego Zone 10B, where you don't really get a hard freeze, you could just grow beets essentially year round. But in the summertime, they don't taste as good, which is why they're recommended for fall or early spring growing, depending on where you live. When you're making your planting list, don't forget to add flowers. Flowers not only add beauty to the garden, but just like herbs, they attract beneficial insects and pollinators as well. And that's who I rely on for the heavy lifting in pest control in my garden. Two of my favorite cool season flowers that are excellent companion plants are marigolds and bachelor's buttons. I love walking around the garden and tucking in a few seeds in each garden bed. Both of these flowers are simple to grow from seeds started directly in the garden, and they have a long blooming season. We're going to get a lot of blooms from just one package of seeds. It's easy to get overwhelmed or confused when you're thinking about all of the do's and don'ts with companion plantings. The best thing to do is focus on adding a wide variety of vegetables, herbs, and flowers to your beds, and you won't go wrong. Here in Zone 7B, October is the perfect time to plant edible perennials like blueberries. Planting your berries in the fall allows the plant to really focus on establishing a really great root system and preparing for the upcoming winter dormancy and then eventually spring where we get those delicious berries. Most of us here in the United States, no matter where you live, can grow blueberries. They can be grown in ground, but my favorite way to plant them is in containers. When you're choosing your blueberry plants, you wanna make sure that you're choosing a variety that's gonna thrive in your area. Different varieties are gonna require a different amount of chill hours, which are just the amount of hours that the temperature drops below 45 degrees Fahrenheit, and that can vary widely from growing zone to growing zone. This variety, for instance, is called Blueberry Buckle, and it requires 350 chill hours, and so it's suited to zones six through 10, so it is a warmer weather variety. Don't worry, there are plenty of varieties out there for those of you in colder growing zones, and if you're purchasing from a local garden center, they're gonna be selling varieties that are suited to your area. Before we plant blueberries, we need to prep the soil a little bit, because blueberries like acidic soil, about a pH of 4.5, to five. In this bed, I've just added a mix of organic potting soil and compost, and it probably isn't acidic enough for their liking. So we're just gonna add some of this soil acidifier before planting. Now it's just as simple as planting the blueberries in this container, and they're gonna be about two feet apart, which is the minimum that you need when planting blueberries. I like to cover the soil with a straw mulch to keep the roots nice and cozy in fall and winter while they're establishing and getting ready for spring. October is actually a perfect time for me to fix a major problem here in the garden, which is that I never put a pollinator patch on this side. Over in the other garden, I have a very well-established pollinator patch that's able to service my entire garden as a habitat for beneficial insects and pollinators alike. But I made one mistake, which is that I didn't actually put in a native California mix. But fear not, because today we are remedying that by putting in this California color mix from Botanical Interest. Now, I wanna mention a couple things about successfully growing a mix of different flowers. First of all, if you take a look at the seed, it's a crazy mix of different sized and shaped seeds. They're all ranging from some seeds being 
really tiny to others being 20 to 30 times the size of the smallest seed. So you wanna make sure that you give this pack a really good mix before you dump it into your hand to do some sowing. Now what I'm going to do here is just move aside some of the surface mulch and sow directly onto the earth below. I'm also going to take my hand and run it across the surface to create some rough edges to allow the seeds to catch and give them somewhere to establish. The last thing I'm going to do is actually take a container like this of just plain old clean potting mix and I'm going to plant my initial seeds right into that. The reason for that is that I'm just not familiar with what these seedlings look like. So if I were to take these and actually scatter them across this area where I want them to grow, I might come back and then not be sure if what's growing are weeds or the seedlings I actually want. So this little pot's going to serve as an identification check so that I know every single seedling as it emerges, what it looks like so I don't accidentally kill it. The last thing I'm gonna do here is just press them in with my hand to give them a really good soil to seed contact. And then I'm just going to cover them up with some mulch. This will help protect them from the birds, which otherwise would love to eat all the seed. So I wanna make sure I hide them with a pretty thick layer here. And then the last thing I'm going to do is just water it in. And we should have a very nice wildflower patch established. The best thing about starting in October is that the rains will help support these plants so that come early spring, they'll begin blooming and then they'll bloom all throughout spring and maybe even to early summer. So now, great time to start a wildflower native garden in your garden today. It's the beginning of cool season planting and there is no better time to add a variety of herbs and flowers to your garden beds. One of my favorite cool season herbs to grow is cilantro. It grows easily from seeds started directly in the garden. It tastes delicious and the pollinators love it. I like to succession plant cilantro every couple of weeks throughout the season. That way I'm adding cilantro to different areas of my garden. If you've grown cilantro, you've probably noticed that it will bolt or go to seed. That's one of the things I love about cilantro. Those bolting flowers are going to attract my favorite beneficial insects and pollinators. Succession plant cilantro every few weeks and you'll have a continuous supply of fresh cilantro and fresh blossoms for the pollinators. Unlike the bean varieties that we are used to growing during the summer, fava beans or broad beans actually favor the cooler weather in the fall and winter. When sown in the fall, you get a bit of a head start on that springtime harvest because the plants, even though they're quite young, are quite cold hardy and they overwinter beautifully. So right now is the perfect time to get these seeds into the ground. When shopping for seeds, you'll likely come across different varieties and also different types, cover crop types, and also ones that are better suited for eating. So make sure you grab the right type for your needs. The cover crop seeds are much smaller and they should be sown at around one inch deep, whereas the larger seeded varieties should be sown at two inches deep. Since these cover crop plants are grown mostly as a nitrogen fixer, the lush and brittle plants are chopped down at the time of flowering to get the most out of this property. So this means you won't get any fruit, meaning the pods, to harvest with this type of fava bean. Thankfully, there are many amazing varieties that are grown for their large pods and tasty seeds that mature in the spring from a fall sowing. Windsor is a tried and true favorite of many gardeners and I've grown about half a dozen other varieties. My favorite one being a red flowering one, which really stood out against the more common white flowering varieties. For both the cover cropping and the large potted varieties, you want to have the plants at least six inches apart to start. So these plants get large and bushy, so you want to give them space to grow. If you want some gorgeous color in your garden next year come early spring, now's the time to plant your spring bulbs. There are loads of different spring bulbs that you can plant, but here I have a funky mix of fringed tulips. Never planted a variety like this before, so I'm excited to see these, and a beautiful daffodil mix. It's really easy to plant spring bulbs, and we have thick clay soil here in North Carolina, so an easy way to make a nice hole for bulbs is with an auger attached to a drill. Different bulbs and different varieties like to be planted at different depths, so look at your package instructions to see the proper depth when planting. First, I'm just going to dig a nice hole, and since I'm planting in ground in the native soil, I'm just going to toss in some compost or potting soil mix. Then I'm just going to pop my bulb into the hole at the proper planting depth, making sure that the bulb is pointy side up and filling it in. Then I always like to top with a layer of mulch to keep them cozy during the winter. Planting in ground, I like to plant them in a grouping, kind of cluster
clustered together. Planting in my garden beds, however, I like to be a bit chaotic and just kind of plant one or two in random spots around the edges or the corners of my beds so that there's some nice spring color growing alongside my spring veggies. Trust me, after a long winter of no flowers and you see that first daffodil pop out of the ground, spring you is gonna be thanking fall you for planting those bulbs. So this is your sign, get out there and plant those bulbs. This next crop is one that much like the garlic, I've had some ups and downs with over the years, but I think I've finally figured out how to master it, at least for my climate, with the exception of growing a giant one, which I've tried and failed a few times, and that would of course be the cabbage. So the three varieties I have for you, you really have a green, a red, and then a Napa style cabbage, which is often turned into things like kimchi, which is the thing I'm actually most excited to grow this year. One kilo slow bolt. This is my Napa style that I'm putting in. I'll be putting in a classic red acre, probably not too many of them this year. And then also the Copenhagen market, which is the standard green cabbage. I had some massive Copenhagen market cabbages last year really, really pleasing to grow. So the thing with cabbage, it's a brassica, much like a broccoli or a cauliflower or a kale or a kohlrabi. In a warm climate like mine here in San Diego, I cannot grow these very well in the spring leading into summer and also in the summer leading into fall. The success and the secret that I unlocked this past season that had me having like just massive cabbages was saying I'm growing them purely through our classic winter, which means starting them sometime around mid-October, maybe late October, and getting them in the ground to experience the absolute coldest portion of my growing season here. Why? Two reasons. Number one, brassicas prefer those temperatures. They really thrive in a nice, cool temp and can also tolerate a bit of frost, tends to make them a little bit sweeter, a little bit more flavorful. Second, the biggest problem with these bad boys is something called the cabbage looper or the cabbage worm. It is this little green caterpillar. It comes from these white moth or butterflies absolutely decimates cabbage, any really brassica. It just destroys them and it also destroys your Mutu garden. Well, they will not really be out if I grow them in the winter. So it's a double threat. I got a good climate and I avoid the major pest. That is why I love growing cabbage starting in October. If you want a more in-depth guide on cabbage and other brassicas, I have that video right here for you. And remember, all the seeds you see, as well as our seed garlic, can be purchased at our store link in the description. Good luck in the garden and keep on growing.